everybody, a fun one today, you know, for a change. Jeremy Peters reports for the New York Times. Jeremy was one of the authors of an article this past week on the Dominion v. Fox lawsuit, which included a lot of revelations about the Fox News Channel that confirmed, well, everything we already knew, which is that they are lying liars, but more than that, they are cynical, shameless, uh, greedy, power-hungry lowlifes. A little background, uh, there was a presidential election way back in 2020, which Joe Biden won, which is why uh, he's the president. Donald Trump and a lot of people who work for Trump, like uh, Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, claimed that the election had been stolen from Trump through a number of schemes. Chief among them, a voting machine scam where these Dominion voting machines switched hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Trump votes to Biden votes. Turned out that wasn't true. That didn't happen. Nevertheless, Fox News kept reporting that that had actually been the case, even well after Fox knew that it wasn't. Hence the defamation lawsuit for $1.6 billion, which looks pretty nailed down, if you ask me. And a lot of lawyers, including lawyers who usually defend media organizations on the principle that we need news organizations to be willing to report on malfeasance and corruption, even if they make a mistake or two or three every once in a while, as long as the mistake was not made maliciously or with total disregard for the truth. See, for someone to successfully sue a news organization for defamation, they have to prove that it was done with either malicious intent or with the knowledge that the accusations just were not true. And as I said, it turns out that the Dominion voting machines didn't switch any votes. And even after people at Fox News were very well aware of that, they just kept putting folks on the air, repeating it over and over again, even though Fox knew, of course, that it wasn't true. And the reason they did that, well, uh, the Fox election desk had been the first network desk to call the election in Arizona for Biden, and Fox viewers were incensed and quickly started abandoning Fox for Newsmax and OAN. Fox ratings went way down, and that means money and prestige, of course. And it turns out that money and prestige and power are much more important to the folks at Fox than the truth. And that might be the case for a lot more people than we, we care to think, but most times folks are less obvious about it and uh, more careful. But then again, Fox News has been extremely obvious about it throughout its entire existence. And this time they really screwed up and left a paper and or electronic trail that is as hilarious as it is devastating. So this is about Dominion v. Fox. This is a lawsuit that will be decided by a jury and Jeremy and I will discuss the case and the Supreme Court ruling behind it, Sullivan v. New York Times, uh, which in 1965 established the malice standard. And we're going to be discussing another case, this one that was uh, heard this last week in the Supreme Court, Gonzalez v. Google, the family of a young 23-year-old woman who was one of 150 people killed in Paris in a series of ISIS attacks back in 2015, her family suing Google, which owns YouTube, for posting an ISIS recruitment video. And that suit gets to an issue I've talked about here a number of times, a Section 230 of the 1995 Internet Protection Act. This was written very early in the history of the Internet to protect the First Amendment, to protect freedom of speech. And it said that these platforms, like now YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, are platforms, not publishers, if they are publishing someone else's content, which made sense then, a complete sense. 
But the business model has changed since 1995, and the business model for these platforms is advertising, and therefore keeping users' attention, keeping them on the platform is the key to their revenue. And there are these things called algorithms, which are a form of AI, and it knows you extremely well, taking thousands of data points from you all the time, and it figures out what keeps you online. And for some people, it's stuff that makes them angry. So often, millions of times a day, I would guess, these algorithms are feeding unhappy or disturbed or angry people or all the above stuff that the algorithm knows will keep them disturbed and on the platform. So we know this has become a real problem. It has led to a lot of hateful disinformation disseminated in a way that has led to genocide in Myanmar and mass shootings in places like El Paso and Pittsburgh and Buffalo. And there are a lot of us that think we need to just take another look at Section 230, and this is what Gonzalez v. Google is about. So two very different cases, Dominion v. Fox, Gonzalez v. Google, both involved dangerous disinformation that led to people dying. Now, one little thing, you'll hear at the beginning that along with Jeremy Peters, I was going to have a media lawyer, Lee Levine, to weigh in on some of these legal issues. And we had a technical issue with Lee, which is he had no headphones. And that presented an insolvable audio problem for us. But uh, Jeremy was more than sufficient. And uh, I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. Well, some of it. Jeremy, what you and I are going to do the best of this, right? I hope I can carry the show on my own. Well, you did last time, so there's that. But one thing I was going to ask Lee was if he had ever sued me. <laughs> um, the thing about Lee is that he he uh, is is a media attorney, and he takes the side of media companies. So you'd think in Dominion v. Fox, he'd be on the Fox side. Because Dominion, of course, is a voting machine company. Fox sued me once. I don't know if you remember that. I wrote a book called uh, Lies and Lying Liars Who Tell Them a Fair and Balanced Look of the Right. And uh, Fox tried to sue, and you know the law of this, they tried to sue me before the book came out. They tried to uh, stop the publication of the book on, <laughs> on the uh, principle that it was uh, copyright infringement because uh, the subtitle was Lies and Lying Liars Who Tell Them a Fair and Balanced Look at the Right, and they said that was infringing fair and balanced. You, you got the satire, right, Jeremy? I did get the satire, yes. Fox, well, it, it's not surprising that they sued you. They, they have a lot of lawyers, and it turns out that they really need them. <laughs> well, in this case, they do. In that case, they didn't need them because it was a ridiculous case, and <laughs> it was Bill O'Reilly who forced them yep. to do it, and uh, they, you know, it, 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 they just got laughed out of court. And it turns yep. out that satire is protected speech, even if the object of the satire doesn't get it. Yeah, well, it, it turns out that lying is not protected speech, uh, and that's why Fox <laughs> News is in so much trouble well, now. Very good point. It was, it's the same issue, isn't it? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you were going to ask Lee about, uh, you know, this, this case and um, if he wanted Fox to win. The thing about a lot of people like Lee, and I don't know what his positions are on this case, um, but a lot of lawyers like him who defend media companies, and I wrote a story about this last year, they actually want Fox News to lose this case. And that's pretty rare because these people are are pretty close to being like First Amendment absolutists. Like it's it's a, the, the the bar is very high in these cases for someone to prove that a media company is is uh, liable for defamation. Um, it's high for a reason because we want to protect um, the ability of the of the press to remain free. But in this case, it's it's the magnitude of the lies that. Are, it's just so extraordinary. I mean, defamation cases, you know, people think like Amber Heard, Johnny Depp, right? Okay. That was one sentence in an op-ed uh, that the Washington Post published. 
In this case involving Fox News, you're talking about night after night, program after program, day after day, 200 pages in, in Dominion's legal complaint cataloging all the different ways that Fox News told its audience one thing about voter fraud in the 2020 election, but privately we're saying they think this is all bullshit. And, and that's a direct quote. Now, let me tell you why I think uh, why I but pretty much know where Lee would have come down on this. The same place with those other uh, media lawyers, because evidently Gorsuch and Thomas really did want to revisit this. And this comes from a uh, landmark case, New York Times versus Sullivan, right? From 1965. And uh, as I recall, that case was uh, the New York Times took out an ad, I think it was, not a story, but took out an ad about uh, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, yes, it was someone who took out an ad in the New York Times. Someone took out an ad in the New York Times and, and, and talked about how to- many times Martin Luther King uh, Jr. had been arrested uh, in Montgomery and talked about a number of things. And some of those were inaccurate. Right. And so uh, this guy, Sullivan, who I think was the uh, marshal, sued the New York Times and won, I think, on a, a district court and a circuit court in Alabama. And then the Supreme Court took it and reversed it 9-0. And it basically reversed Mm -hmm. it 9-0 because for the reason we want to protect the right of the press to write things about public officials, first of all. Mm -hmm. And the decision here was, unless you are doing this with malice, is that... Actual malice is the legal standard. Uh, that's what it's called. But then there's another thing, which is or a total disregard for the truth. For is the that- truth, yeah. So that's that's basically saying a plaintiff in a defamation lawsuit has to prove that the person they're accusing of defamation knew that they were lying, but did so anyway, or that they were so reckless in their rush to say something, to publish something that recklessness caused them to overlook an obvious truth. Now, in the Fox News case, there's ample evidence that they, as I said before, were telling their audience one story, but behind closed doors, over text messages, um, uh, emails, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, were all saying that they thought Trump's lawyer, Sidney Powell, was crazy, that she's nuts. And that's about as close as you can get to proving that they knew what they were putting on their shows was wrong, but they did it anyway. And Dominion in this case lays out a really compelling argument for why they did that. And it was because their audience had started to flee. It started to go to Newsmax and to OAN after Fox correctly predicted that Biden would win Arizona and become the president. And that pissed off uh, the Fox viewers. Exactly. It, they pissed off the Fox viewers the, because they told them the truth that Trump wasn't going to get a second term. Well, it turns out um, not only were, were Fox viewers pissed off, but Tucker Carlson was pissed off. And, and we now know that he was texting his producers um, and his colleagues saying that Fox's decision desk, which called the election um, and, and said that Biden was going to win Arizona, was ruining their credibility and ruining their standing with their audience that they'd taken years to build. So the reason that Fox told its audience a story that wasn't true was because that was the story its audience wanted to hear. It didn't want to hear that Trump had lost. Well, of course, they didn't want to hear that. And uh, if I were Tucker, I would have been pissed at uh, that arm of the, of the election team. Because, you know, hey, guys, why do you have to do that? (laughs) Because it's really close. (laughs) Could you hold off for a little while until you're absolutely sure? And, of course, they were absolutely right. So there's that. They were absolutely right. Like, that's one of the great ironies here, right, is that Fox is good journalism. I mean, they do have honest, like hardworking, real reporters there um, in their Washington bureau in New York and places overseas. And then they have this, this decision desk that Rupert Murdoch built to be second to none, um, that it was supposed to be the leader in the media business. And it was supposed to call races as 
quickly as humanly possible. Well, that's exactly what it did here. It did a good job. It got it right. And it was first. But when your audience doesn't want to hear the truth, uh, it's kind of hard to keep telling them that if you're in the ratings business. What makes Fox so much different than I think most other news organizations is just how purely profit driven it is. It's it's very profitable for a reason because they don't tell their audience what it doesn't want to hear. It's very on message. It's very consistent that way. But what you see happening with Dominion and, and the, the constant lies that were told about Dominion on Fox News is that there was like a complete and total breakdown of any sense of obligation to journalistic values and obligation really to democracy itself, because they were willing certain producers and hosts on the show, uh, Lou Dobbs, um, Tucker Carlson, to a certain extent, Maria Bartiroma, definitely. They were willing to tell their audience something that it looks like they knew not to be true. Now, I want to get some sense of the chronology here, because Mm -hmm. I could see putting out a false story about election fraud, if you hear it from somebody, right? And there are plenty of, I'm sure, Republicans, operatives in the field who were shouting, hey, uh, they dumped ballots from a truck, right? (laughs) That wouldn't be reckless disregard for the truth because you'd be reporting something that some, (laughs) you know, partisan reported (laughs) that was a lie. But Okay, so that was how long after it came back to them that, boy, this is not true. Wow, wowie, wow, 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 not true. For example, this Fox reporter, Jackie Henrik, posted a tweet that debunked Trump's lies about Dominion, right? And Tucker went Mm -hmm. nuts and said, get her fired. You know what that could do to our stock? It, it, it was what it was doing to their stock. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. This is a point, as I think people recall, when Newsmax and OAN were having a, a bit of a moment, right? Was there a bit of a moment because of this? Was that was there a bit of the moment or was it, had it preceded that a little bit? It started almost immediately after the election. And, you know, I can, I can, I can tell you, the, the moment when uh, Tucker Carlson you know, and his producer on November 5th said the Trump folks are being reckless demagogues. That's a direct quote. That, that was a text from Tucker Carlson's producer to Tucker. And Tucker says, of course they are. We're not going to follow them. Well, guess what he did? <laughs> he followed them. He followed the crazy people who were being reckless, uh, who were alleging that Dominion voting machines had somehow flipped votes from Trump and gave them to Biden because it was a company that was founded by Hugo Chavez in Venezuela to rig elections. And like the and that's the, true, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes on his show. The next day, at the day after he says that we're not going to follow these people on November 5th, 2020, and he tells his audience that some of these claims are cr- voter fraud claims were, quote, credible. Well, could he could he argue and are the Fox lawyers arguing? Well, some of them were. Not this one. <laughs> we we know this one is incredible, but some are. And then he could point to some of them are. I mean, that's if. If I were a lawyer, that's what I would argue. Well, he didn't mean that one. But, but let me ask you, was the Dominion piece, was, mm-hmm. was that repeated after it became very, very clear? We know now as, as part of this lawsuit that Dominion and its, and its PR firm sent thousands and thousands of pages of true statements about Dominion, who founded it, why it was founded, where it was headquartered, what its voting machines were capable of doing, how they were safe, what the software, you know, all of this to rebut the crazy claims out there. This um, conspiracy was afoot to deny Trump a second term. Thousands and thousands of pages of this stuff. So they had in their possession, Fox producers, Fox hosts, the CEO of Fox News herself received this information from Dominion. Still, not on every show, but on the, the, the shows highlighted in this lawsuit, Lou Dobbs, Maria Bartiromo, Tucker Carlson, they were still repeating these lies. And not, not only do we know that the Dominion had provided them with ample evidence that this stuff was just wrong, but we know that 
people inside Fox News were saying they knew it was wrong. For example, Sidney Powell, who was on the president's uh, legal team for quite a bit there, didn't she come on one of the shows and everyone (laughs) after she was off kind of say, wow, that was loony? Yes, that's exactly what happened. Um, She gave uh, (laughs) an interview to Maria Bartiromo and then Brett Baer says to one of his colleagues, uh, wow, what was that? Oh, on um, the air. <laughs> on the air. And Tucker Carlson, November 15th, a direct quote from Tucker Carlson, a text. Sidney Powell is lying. Mm-hmm. And it, so he must have pointed that out himself the next uh, show, the next opportunity he had. Yeah, exactly. The, the, no, I mean, to, to, to Tucker's credit, he did at one point um, say, OK, put up or shut up, Sidney Powell. Show us the evidence. Your claims need to be backed up, and we haven't seen any evidence of them so far. But that, And that was uh, late November 2020. But the problem was, once he said that, he caught such hell from his audience that he stopped exactly doing it. the phenomenon that he was worried about was happening to him. So guess what? He, he shut up about it, and he hosted um, guys like Mike Lindell on a show, the My Pillow Guy conspiracy theorist. And, and he's one of the uh, people that uh, Dominion is going after, right? How, how many are they're going after OAN? Are they going after Newsmax? Are they going after, I mean, it's, it's not just Fox, yeah. right? It's not just Fox. I mean, it's all, it's all those. Um, and then you have a separate lawsuit by Smartmatic, another voting machine company that was also the the subject of conspiracy theory. I think Smartmatic has even a better case. And here's why. I don't think Smartmatic was in any of those voting machines that were a question. Well, that's true. Dominion <laughs> was. And so you know, you're getting at something. I mean, you said that, that you could see an outcome which is not good for Dominion, that, that they lose this case. And I think that's, I, I mean, it's not an outcome. I don't think I so. I think we should rule out. One thing I, I, when I was reading about Lee, uh, he, of course, defends media companies. And uh, you'd think. Including people, New York Times. Yeah. yeah, including New York Times. So, and you think that, okay, uh, I want this to stand. I want Sullivan versus uh, New York or New York Times versus Sullivan to stand. And there is some, been some pressure from, I understand, Clarence Thomas and uh, Neil Gorsuch to bring this up again and maybe weaken it. Yeah. And the reason I read that Lee wanted, in this case, for Dominion to beat Fox, to to beat the media company, is that this will say, you see? You see, if it's bad enough, the media company gets gets dinged. Mm Mm-hmm. That's why people want, some people want Fox to lose this case, so they can say, no, Clarence Thomas and Neil Gorsuch, you're wrong. Libel laws don't need to be revisited. Um, the Supreme Court should not look at loosening the, the actual malice standard in New York Times v. Sullivan. You know, if Fox loses this case, a lot's going to happen. But that's one outcome that, that some First Amendment advocates want to see. You know, I think the question that we were just talking about whether or not Dominion does lose, all it takes is one juror to say, I don't think that this is actual malice. And Fox is trying to accomplish that a number of ways. But uh, the, the most persuasive one, perhaps, I, I think, is they're going to argue, in effect, that these conspiracy theories about Dominion machines aren't that implausible. And by that, I mean, okay. they're going to say, look, <laughs> Dominion software had vulnerabilities. And it was entirely reasonable for somebody to believe uh, that that its machines were hacked and that you could uh, monkey around with the results and you could find somebody you know who, who who says yeah that 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 sounds reasonable to me and if that person is on the jury this this could be a tough case for Dominion. Well, that's why the timeline to me makes a lot of sense of when this stuff was coming out within Fox and when people within Fox were saying like oh this <laughs> this is bullshit. Uh, we can't go with this any longer. And it seems like that was over quite a bit of time. It was over weeks. I mean, it, it, <laughs> weeks. And that's why 
this case is so extraordinary because there's weeks and weeks of TV show transcripts that Dominion can point to and, and, and show a jury um, and, and then compare those transcripts alongside the actual dialogue of Fox executives and hosts behind the scenes, uh, like Tucker Carlson, who is saying on November 15th, Sidney Powell is lying. <laughs> it's really remarkable uh, when you think about it, the, the, that they kept doing this. And there's actually a bit of consternation in the documents that we've now seen where executives are saying they can't control their own hosts. I mean, one one no. executive, he's the president. Can't of the sue network. us. We can't control these guys. They say that flat out, and they say they say to uh, about Lou Dobbs. One of them, the president of the network. This is my favorite line from the from the brief. He says that Lou Dobbs, the North Koreans, do a more nuanced TV show than Lou Dobbs. Mm-hmm. And I remember them having a North Korean show on Fox, but it was like a late night thing. Mm-hmm. And they only <laughs> ran it for like seven years because they weren't proud of it. What the fuck? Then, <laughs> so how long was Dobbs on for? Dobbs's show is eventually canceled. I know, but how long was it on for before that? So in other words, look, Lou Dobbs show is about as credible. is less credible than a North Korean show. Uh-huh. And... May I, in cross-examine, ask you, <laughs> how long did you have Lou Dobbs on your, oh, 14 years or 17? Well, I mean, I don't know, unless I'm that one juror that they're counting on. I kind of think that looks uh, it looks kind of hinky. Yeah, and we know, like, just the, the, the descent into crazy land here that, that, that was happening on Fox. We now know, thanks to this lawsuit, the source of the conspiracy theories that Dobbs and, and Maria Bartiromo were putting on the air. Sidney Powell, when she came on to talk about these claims that votes were being switched from Biden to Trump, she was relying on a woman who was so deranged that she claimed to be, be able to talk to the wind. And she claimed that she had once been decapitated. I mean, this woman was a nut. Bartiromo and okay. Dobbs knew that. Now, is that in the court filings? I mean, in other words, is that relevant? Yes, it's relevant because that shows <laughs> okay. that Dobbs and Bartiromo knew where Sidney Powell was getting her information from and that it was from a bogus, unreliable source. I mean, that they had an email that Sidney Powell had forwarded to them in which this woman says, this is a quote, who am I and how do I know all of this? I've had the strangest dream since I was a little girl. I was internally decapitated and yet I live. The wind tells me I'm a ghost, but I don't believe it. They put Sidney Powell on the air knowing that she relied on this person as a source of her information. That's also pretty compelling evidence that uh, actual malice exists here. Hey, uh, Bob, did you read this memo? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did. And did you report that to Maria and to Lou? Yeah. They, <laughs> they were fascinated because Lou had also been decapitated as a child. <laughs> okay, let's talk. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to bring up uh, Gonzalez v. Google. It's a very different case, completely different case. And this is a family, the Gonzalez family, who is suing Google because Google owns YouTube. And they put out, they linked people to YouTube ISIS videos, recruitment videos. And their daughter was killed along with, what, 130 other people in these attacks in Paris that that were carried out during the course, I guess, of, of a day by ISIS. And this is about Section 230. Section 230, of course, is part of the Internet Decency Act, which was passed, what, in 1994 or 5, 5, which was protecting social media platforms, saying you're just linking to other things other people have put out. So you shouldn't be held liable. You're, you're not a publisher. You're just a platform. And this is like, a, this is a good thought. This is First Amendment. This is, we want people to be exposed to everything and anything 
That's freedom of speech. That's the First Amendment, right? Yeah, that's that's their argument. Um, but I think like the question in this case is whether or not the the tech companies, Google in this case, uh, is responsible for for a death that resulted indirectly uh, from the publishing of that information. And Google and and the tech companies would score a major victory here uh, if the court eventually decides not to rein in those parts of, of, of Section 230. They have the tech world now has this broad immunity that allows people to post pretty much whatever they want. And companies like Google are not liable. Um, they can post lies. They can post exactly the kind of lies that we've been talking about, uh, about Dominion that smeared Dominion in its name. If they're done on Facebook by you or me or some Trump voter in, in Pennsylvania, that Trump voter can't be sued. But because of these broad protections in Section 230, uh, the broad immunity um, that it provides the tech companies, um, it's not like Fox can get sued for publishing information like that. It, it, it can and it is, as we've seen. But the, the, the point of this was that these platforms were new then. Social media was new. And the idea. And, but at that time, there weren't these algorithms, right? That's right. It's a very different. Yeah. People are very concerned that this like the law has just outlived uh, its 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 usefulness that the world. I mean, the technological world has changed in it leaps and bounds in two years. I mean, two years alone. Okay. When this law was passed in the 90s, I mean, like it's it's I can't even what was what were we doing in 1996? Like what? I don't even know that I, I had a stronger Internet connection than a, a dial up modem in my house. I was on DOS. <laughs> and yeah, Netscape. You could use Netscape as your browser. Yeah, here's the thing is that since then, the whole economic model of social media has completely changed and it's advertising, right? That's exactly right. It's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all clicks. And so it's all clicks, but it's all, it's all actually about keeping people on, on, your, on your platform. So because you're selling advertising. Right. You're selling advertising. Well, well what also keeps uh, people on your platform is uh, provocative, incendiary content. And that's exactly what the kind of stuff that allows rumors like the big lie to spread unchecked and take hold in society. Like the companies have too much profit at stake to, to want the Supreme Court to poke any holes in Section 230. Because once you start saying they can be sued for allowing certain type of content on your website, all bets are off. Now, the court, the Supreme Court who heard this case, they seemed pretty confused about what to do. It sounded, it, it was just not clear that they were willing to go there. They, they seemed genuinely confused in a sincere way, I would say. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, Kagan said, we're not the nine yeah. experts. Every other industry has to internalize the costs of his conduct. Why is it that the tech industry gets a pass? A little bit unclear. On the other hand, I mean, we're a court. We really don't know about these things. You know, these are not like the nine greatest experts on the internet. <laughs> but here's my argument about this, which is that it's been shown, and we've seen uh, from Facebook and other places, people saying, what we do is try to keep people on. And the way we know that, that we can keep people on is some people making them angry. There are trillions of data points, right? Yeah. Out there all the time. Yeah, exactly. And they, they know you better than you know you. They know every click you've made. And their algorithms are, it's artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, of course, getting better and better all the time. And the data on you is getting greater and greater all the time. And basically, it's been shown that in places like Myanmar and other places, they have caused terrible things to happen by pushing content on people because it'll keep them online longer. Yeah, they've admitted to that. And, and that's also, it's not only responsible for horrible things like January 6th happening, but it's responsible for a, a mental health crisis among America's teenagers, especially teenage girls who sit there online and, and, and Instagram and look at 
images of girls who they think are prettier uh, or are better than them in some way. And it's it's been well documented how the, how harmful a lot of this stuff is to kids. And not only do they know, does Facebook know this and other platforms know this, but they use it because all they care about is their profit, basically. Exactly. I mean, it's very similar to what we were discussing about Fox News, right? You give, I mean, people want this. They want provocative content. They want stuff that makes them angry. They want stuff that makes them feel envious. Just like Fox News's audience wanted to be told that there was still a chance that Trump might pull it off because Biden and his Democratic cronies had stolen the election. I mean, what percentage of the people who attacked the Capitol on on January 6th, got that stuff online. I'm sure a lot of them. And, you know, I think 17% of Americans believe that, you know, uh, Democrats kidnap children and kill them and drink their blood. Right. It, it really is. It's like 17%. <laughs> and- <laughs> well, no, it's it's not an insignificant percentage of Trump voters who, who believe in QAnon conspiracy theories either. And, and Trump's own pollster has pointed this out. He recognized that Trump's base, his hardest core base, believes in this stuff. What's pretty remarkable about that is like, no, not that you, you mention people on January 6th found this stuff online. They were fed a diet of misinformation, disinformation, and it radicalized enough of them to go to Washington and storm the Capitol. But where they also got it from was Fox News. And in Dominion's lawsuit, there's a really chilling photograph of a guy who has you know, since been arrested, who's standing in front of his television with a rifle in one hand and a, a flag in the other. And he's got Lou Dobbs' television show on in the background. <laughs> and he went to the Capitol and stormed it on January 6th. Yeah. So that's what these have in common is that disinformation. Would you say that um, ISIS uh, recruiting videos are disinformation. <laughs> well, the thing is, is, yeah, I mean, this this stuff is it's like as old as propaganda itself, right? I mean, yeah, that's definitely disinformation. I'm uh, I'm old enough to remember when they were doing this by magazine. There was actually an ISIS magazine. Now, the <laughs> it'd be easier to hunt down and like sue the publisher of ISIS magazine, probably. Um, than it would be to sue Google for posting um, ISIS recruiting videos. But no, they they did. They came up with this magazine. It was called Inspire. And it had things in there like uh, a, an instructional guide on how to make a homemade bomb. Like this, this stuff is out there. And I think a lot of people just find it pretty preposterous that there isn't a way to fix that, that, that Google isn't or somebody at least doesn't have to be google but google's the publisher of it ultimately uh or the or the conduit for it uh, rather but the, there's nobody you can hold accountable for for allowing stuff like that to fester online well here's what i think is going to happen uh, first of all i think i kind of think dominion wins this one because <laughs> of just of of what we've been talking about and the weight of the evidence. I actually think that the Supreme Court is not is going to say to Congress, address this. Or do you not think that? It sounds like that from from the oral arguments. I mean, they were they were pretty confused about what to do. It's 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 something Kagan and Kavanaugh suggested um, was, you know, ruling for uh, uh, the, the Gonzalez family could unleash this wave of lawsuits. Um, so it seems very plausible that Congress should deal with this, right? But I mean, <laughs> you tell me you were in Congress it, 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 and every year it got harder and harder to pass a bill naming a post office after someone. I mean, they can't even agree to do anything anymore, but let alone a landmark piece of legislation addressing something like tech policy, which, you know, by the way, imagine how that would be lobbied against. I mean, the, the, the tech companies are so wealthy. They employ so many lobbyists and have such deep pockets. Some, some of whom are the, um, you know, children of, of important members of Congress. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the chances of this, you're saying, are, are a zero. 
I, 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 let's put it this way. I'm not getting my hopes up. I think the odds of Congress, be, whenever Congress has the opportunity to do something good, it seems like they always find a way to screw it up. I mean, it's a, it's a, they, some, they can, they can never. Well, well, no, we pass, uh, pass the Affordable Care Act. Well, that's true. Uh, that was uh, the Inflation and that was, Reduction Act. That was how many years ago? Like, I mean, it, it's, it's a while ago. Remember Social Security? Gee. <laughs> exactly. Well, lately. That was great. What con- the, the inability of Congress to pass major legislation is, is a huge And problem. also controversial stuff that really is complicated, like immigration. Like immigration. Where people can stake out areas that, that they have a constituency for and can just freeze everything in place. So, yeah, no, I think, uh, I, yep, I, but it'll be interesting. I would, I, I, I'm not sure if it's until June that we hear about uh, where, where they're coming down on this, but I'll bet you that they say it's up to Congress to do some rewriting here, and I'll bet you that uh, you and I are probably right that they won't. Unfortunately. Ta-da! And thus ends another Al Franken podcast. A satisfying ending <laughs> for all my listeners. Well, thank you, Jeremy. I'm sorry that your cohort on your 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 piece, on the, uh, Lee Levine, wasn't able to make it, but I think you uh, filled in on the legal side almost as well as I did. Well, thanks for having me, as always, and I'd love to come back anytime. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.